Hello, my name is Michael Bazzelli, and I'm Professor and Director of the Urban Centre at the University of Western Ontario, the Centre for Urban Policy and Local Governance. The Centre is the hub of the University's research policy and practice in the areas of urban affairs and urban studies and urban planning issues. This video is about climate change in the city, uh, Western's expert panel discussion of London's Climate Emergency Action Plan held on the 31st of March 2022. Many municipalities are developing or have developed climate action plans. Here you see the cover of the City of London's um, published Climate Emergency Action Plan, which was published in February of 2022. Our uh, expert panel was convened to discuss this plan's strengths, what can be improved, and most of all, what can be done in terms of next steps and implementation. And this is particularly important at this point in time because the city is undertaking its public consultation and participation processes. I'd like to thank the Urban Center's Distinguished Practitioner Research Fellow, John Fleming, for moderating our expert panel. And I'd like to thank our panelists as well, Katrina Moser, Martha Paez Domingo, Martin Horak, Megan Stacy, and Dan Leeming. The Urban Center would also like to thank our supporting organizations, the Department of Geography and Environment, the Weeklish Center within the Network of Economic and Social Trends, or NEST at Western, and the Council for Canadian Urbanism. And last but not least, I'd like to thank David Goldblum, James Voot, Lelania Millet, Angelica Lucacci, Ebenezer Nahr, all of the Department of Geography and Environment for helping to put this event together and making sure that it ran smoothly. And I'd also like to thank Leah Huffman and Ali Seven for their uh, support in helping to put this together as well. Thanks to you all. What follows is an insightful, impassioned and engaging discussion that I hope you find helpful in your own work. If you'd like to reach out to the Urban Centre, please do send us an email or follow us on Twitter and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks and enjoy. For those of you attending in person, Western requires masks, so we have to wear our masks, unless you're behind this uh, little goldfish bowl here. If you need to leave, there are exits, exits on either end of the room and one at the back, so that it, uh, you can take whatever is closest. For those of you attending online, online participants will be muted during the presentation and panel discussion, but will unmute you for asking questions during the question period. For those of you in person, we will repeat your questions so that the online audience can hear it. And we'll also monitor the chat during the presentation, so feel free to post questions there and the moderator will put those questions to the, to the panel as well. I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague David Goldblum to give a land acknowledgement. Thank you. So at this point, we'd like to acknowledge the land on which we are gathering. For those of us here in person, we acknowledge that Western University is located on the banks of the Dishkan Zibi or Antler River, on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, the Wanapawak, and Moncton Nations. These lands are connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous people, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. We recognize too that land here is understood more broadly to mean the environment and the coupling of the land and atmosphere are an important element of climate. We acknowledge the unequal responsibilities that arise from human induced climate change and the equal impacts that such changes have, especially on indigenous peoples. I think, are we ready to go to John? Okay, I'll pass it back to Jamie. Thank you. So my great pleasure now to introduce uh, John Fleming, who will be the moderator of our event. John Fleming, probably best known in these parts as the former chief planner of the city of London. He was the managing director and chief planner for a decade, and he did some important city building work during his tenure, including development of the London plan. And he also created a new climate change division in the, in the uh, planning department. John retired from the city in 2019, but like most retirees, he's become busier. In addition to starting up a planning consulting firm called City Planning Solutions, he's been working with us up here at Western, where he holds the title of 
Distinguished Practitioner in Residence at the Center for Urban Policy and Governance. And he has also been working on research at the Human Environments Analysis Lab in Geography and Environment and teaching a course in land use and development issues as part of our urban development program. Thank you, John, for organizing this. Thanks for all your contributions up here at Western. Over to you in the panel. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Boot. I'll give you that. Maybe I'll keep that. Yeah. Sound check. Hear me okay, Michael? That's perfect, thank you. All right. And uh, while I'm at it, I just want to acknowledge Michael Bazzelli. Uh, Michael's done most of the heavy lifting and organizing um, this event. And so, Michael, thank you very much. I know you couldn't be here today, but uh, appreciate you running this behind the scenes. And uh, also, uh, Dr. Goldblum, for all your work in getting things uh, rolling here. So uh, we've got an amazing panel. And I think it's a, a panel that's uh, exceptionally diverse in their perspectives on climate change. So I think we're going to have a really cool, interesting conversation. But before we get going, I'm wondering if, uh, David, you can just get up my presentation. I think we all just kind of need to get on the same page in terms of what are we talking about here and just give a little bit of context. Well, let's see if this will work here. Okay, we got it, perfect. That's good. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about climate change in the city. That's the name of uh, our event here today. Climate change is gonna affect everybody. Nobody's gonna get away from this. It doesn't matter what your resources are, it doesn't matter what your position in life is, it's gonna affect everyone. And it's not just going to affect everyone, it already is. Uh, it's just that those impacts are going to become more extreme. So uh, climate change uh, will affect us in bad weather. This is the one that most people um, think about, extreme weather, I guess you could call it, where you've got extreme winds, flooding, fires, drought, uh, massive snowstorms. Um, and, you know, part of that also, how it's going to affect us is the insurance that comes with us. So I'm just going to give you some, some flavor for this. Um, I think a lot of us have heard this before, but insurance is going to go through the roof, already has. Supply chain, we've learned a lot about supply chain impacts through COVID. Well, just wait, because uh, the things that we uh, consume are being produced and manufactured and packaged and distributed from across the globe. So those supply chains are going to become interrupted uh, through climate change. The food we eat, that's a good example. Uh, the food that we eat comes... In, in many instances from other places in this world and their ability to grow that food, distribute that food is gonna change significantly. Uh, invasive species like our tick here, um, the, the many kinds of uh, uh, invasive species that are plant oriented or insect oriented or animal oriented. We've got diseases that are coming with them as well. All of these things are impacts. The way that you move, uh, that's gonna change significantly. The cost of getting around, it's already, we can see, um, what's happened recently with the cost of fuel imagine two three four dollar gas uh, potentially and you're not going to be able to get away uh, from this by for example hopping on a plane to get away from it the cost of traveling uh, by air is going to become even more significant so think about all these different ways that it's going to affect you again in your pocketbook um, when you look at the cost of energy our bills at home the taxes that go with the operation of uh, municipal services. So it's going to affect everyone. Now, as we have our conversation today, um, we're going to be talking from two different perspectives. So you can take climate change and put it into two different baskets. One is mitigation. That's really all about lessening our impact, uh, our effect, our impact on climate change. And adaptation is all about hunkering down and getting ready for the major impacts, some of which I just explained, but there's going to be lots of them. So adaptation is how can we be resilient? How can we plan for those changes and adapt to them? Now, how is it that cities can have meaningful impact? I think the summary here is just to say that individually, let's not fool ourselves, something that's happening at the City of London is not going to have a massive impact on global climate change. However, if the city is doing its role, and other cities are also doing similarly their role, then cumulatively, collectively, we can have a major impact. 
And so I can't quite read this from here. Let me see if I can scoot around. This is uh, a quote from the UN Secretary uh, General, um, 2019 speech uh, at the C40 World Mayor Summit in Copenhagen. And he said that cities are where the climate battle will largely be won or lost. And he said that cities have an enormous climate footprint consuming more than two thirds of the world's energy and accounting for more than 70% of global CO2 emissions. So you can just from that understand that yes, cities can have and will have a major impact on climate change, either for the positive or the negative, depending on how they act. So greenhouse uh, gas emissions in London, we have Jay Stanford here in the audience and amongst the many people out there, I can see him. And uh, Jay and his team have done a great job of tracking greenhouse gas emissions going way back. Uh, so we have a, a real good sense of what kind of greenhouse gas emissions have been generated by residents. You can see here about five tons by your average city of London residents, half of which relates to uh, gasoline. Another big one, it's kind of behind that sign there, I think, is um, natural gas home heating and then natural gas uh, heating of water and then into uh, waste disposal. So methane that's created from organic um, decomposition. Uh, consumption related greenhouse gases go beyond that. So it, we're fooling ourselves if we only look at it from that perspective, because a lot of the greenhouse gases that we generate relate to the products that we consume. So you can see on this table, uh, this is also from the City of London's uh, Climate Emergency Action Plan. And they have cited that about eight tons are produced by the average Ontarian. And a lot of that is uh, based on, for example, the, the construction, the manufacturing, the um, assembly, the distribution, uh, delivery of the goods that we consume. So just think of all those things that we buy from China and how much greenhouse gas is emitted to produce them and then get them here. So there's 10 areas of focus uh, that are in the Climate Emergency Action Plan that we're going to be talking about today that the City of London recently reduced, or produced and circulated. Um, that document is out for comment and in fact I believe it's next week that Council is going to be reviewing it and discussing it. So the timing of our session is really great. And uh, again, I can't quite see it. I'm going to sneak around here for a second. Um, so we're talking about uh, 10 different areas. I won't go into all of them, but they range from transforming buildings and development, transforming the way that we move, uh, the consumption of waste. A lot of those things that I was just referring to are addressed uh, through the plan in some way or another. But there's those 10 areas of focus. Uh, so what the city's tried to do is organize how we address this big picture of climate change and how the city is affecting climate change and also adapting to it. For each of those 10 areas of focus, uh, the plan lays out work plans. And this is intended to be a little bit more focused and say, okay, we're not just going to talk about these things. We're going to set clear actions and we're going to identify who's responsible for those and how we're actually going to uh, implement them. And then I found this really interesting is that they not only had those 10 areas of focus, but they had several uh, descriptions of um, what it will look like once the plan's implemented. Let's slip on the mask here. So uh, we're talking about walkable, complete neighborhoods, increasing in active transportation, uh, more zero emission vehicles. These are the things that you'll see, uh, according to the city, if their plan is implemented, more net zero buildings, lower carbon construction, et cetera. So the plan gets pretty explicit in understanding that. And then this last piece I find interesting as well. Most plans wouldn't have something like this, but this plan says, hey, the only way we're gonna get there, the only way to get this done is if we get these kinds of things. And one of them is a supportive council. So decisions that are supporting the plan. If we get uh, a sustainable uh, funding program, uh, volunteers, media, need to be involved and, and push it along. Uh, individuals in the community, community groups, businesses, institutions uh, need to lead by example. Uh, I find that interesting. Lifestyle changes is something that's identified. I think that's a really important piece that the city's identified. Incentives and rewards, etc. So hopefully that sets uh, a little bit of a, a base for us to speak from. Now what I'd like to do is introduce our amazing panel. Uh, you can see that you have four people that are sitting at the table to the right of me, but we also have somebody on the line. 
Dan Leeming, are you there? I'm here. Hey, hey, Dan. So uh, Dan is a partner with Planning Partnership. He's going to be joining us just online uh, by phone. And we appreciate you making it, Dan. Uh, he's an extremely well-respected planner in the, the field, but also an extremely well-respected urban designer. Um, he's going to bring a practitioner's view to the conversation. Um, and uh, he is heading up the Resiliency Caucus for the Council for Canadian Urbanism. Um, currently, he's co-authoring an article for Plan Canada called, um, So You've Declared a Climate Emergency, Now What? Sounds pretty relevant. Uh, over to the far right is Katrina Moser, Dr. Katrina Moser. She's an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental uh, and Environment at Western University. Um, Katrina is a climate change scientist. She's been at it for 30 years, which is amazing, way ahead of the curve, and uh, very much uh, been doing both science-based research and teaching on climate change. And uh, what she said to me in our initial conversations with is that she thinks we need a new way forward to tackle climate change. Uh, next, coming this way uh, at the table is Megan uh, Stacy. Megan, can you just wave to the crowd? Uh, so Megan is somebody who watches the politics uh, in London's City Hall every day. Uh, Megan's a journalist with the London Free Press, and that is, I believe, still the place that most Londoners get their local news. Uh, and thank goodness Megan is always there at every meeting. Every, every time I was at a meeting, Megan was at a meeting. Um, but uh, you don't see journalists on panels like this very often. And it's because we tend to focus on those that have subject specific expertise. And I think what um, Megan's bringing to the table is something that is really valuable to the conversation. Um, people I, I found in the media really have a good understanding of the pulse of the community. They understand how decisions are made at, at the municipal council table. And if you ever want to know what's happening at municipal council, hop on to Megan's uh, Twitter feed because she's at these meetings and she's tweeting out for everyone to sort of follow along. It's, it's really amazing. Now, while I'm on the subject of politics, let's go to uh, Dr. Martin Horak. Um, uh, Martin is a professor in political science at Western University. He's also the associate director at the Center for Urban Policy and Local Governance, uh, which is the group that is leading the charge here today, uh, together with the Department of Geography and Environment. Um, he's an expert on the politics of government processes and actions, often quoted here in London. I see him in the paper all the time, probably speaking to Megan. <laughs> so there you go. You're right beside each other. You can have a conversation. And uh, we, we know that governments work through political decision making. So the politics of climate change are extremely important when you're considering what is actually happening when the rubber hits the road. And then finally, right beside me here is Martha Pays Domingo. Uh, Martha is a master's student in the Department of Geography and Environment at Western University. And through our discussions, I learned that she's already building her career in some really great ways with experiences in places like Parks Canada, Natural Resources Canada, and some environmental NGOs. Uh, she's very interested in the social and economic perspectives of climate change, and she brings uh, also a perspective of youth. Not to say that the others on the panel are young, just like me, but... Uh, yeah, I think it's also that valuable perspective of somebody that's in that uh, generation that's going to be seeing a lot of climate change and uh, is really looking for things uh, that are meaningful to be done. So what I'm going to do is maybe I'll just follow the order. We'll go from Katrina this way and uh, ask you for two minutes each just to give your sort of opening salvo. And it could be, you know, what interests you about um, climate change in the city or how cities uh, relate to climate change or um, specifically the city's plan and uh, what your perspective is on that. And I'm going to, we agreed as a panel um, that we're going to be nice and tight with this for two minutes. So if I interrupt them and say, hey, 10 seconds left and they're not going to be mad at me. All right. Okay. Over to you, Katrina. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you just fine? Thanks. Okay, so uh, as John said, I'm Katrina Moser and uh, a professor here in geography and environment at Western. And uh, just to give you a little bit of my background and where I'm coming from uh, at this panel today, I, um, as John mentioned, I've been studying climate change for 30 years. I first got interested at a, um, a 
a talk by Steven Schneider, who's a really well-known climate scientist. And uh, that was the first time I heard that humans were causing climates to change. And I was just incredibly interested in this topic. I ended up doing my graduate work, um, trying to understand how ecosystems respond to climate change, how they responded in the past, hoping to use that information to help understand how they might change in the future. And um, I, uh, since then, became really interested in climate change and education and uh, actually working with uh, Dr. Jamie Vu, who's here in the audience, we developed a course on climate change science. And the idea was to provide knowledge to people about climate change and in particular, the climate change science. And uh, after teaching it for a few years, I had a... Um, a student after class come to me and say, you know, Dr. Moser, I really like your course, but I'm very depressed listening to your lectures. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really moved me, really shifted my thinking. Um, I went on sabbatical the following year. I talked to a lot of people, thought a lot about the course and made some big changes to the course with a new purpose, not only to provide people with the knowledge of climate change, but also to empower students to become engaged and make changes uh, towards making a better future for themselves. And uh, I'm still working on that course and I'm, uh, I'll talk a bit more about this later, but I've been working with a team now of um, educators and we've been trying to weave together um, indigenous knowledge and climate change science to make an online course to be available to everybody to again, try and empower people to make change. So that's that's where I'm coming from uh, to this discussion today. So I will pass it on to you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I wanted to start by saying this week at City Hall, there was a committee meeting where a city councilor talked about delay caused by lack of ambition. And Councillor Helmer wasn't talking about climate change or climate change action exactly. He was talking about capital spending. But I thought, what a good phrase. You could probably apply that to so many council debates. Um, but, you know, to really sum up that idea of what the debates that are happening, you know, in council chambers or these days on Zoom mostly, but, you know, those political debates, how does that translate to the day-to-day -day city building, you know, what's, what's happening out here? And to me, that's kind of this critical but almost unspoken element of this plan and of London's, you know, climate emergency action is what appetite is there to lead the charge to make that change, um, you know, and to provide that, that leadership that's obviously needed from city council. Uh, you know, is there that political will and how far does it extend, uh, you know, to actually drive forward a plan, any plan, this plan perhaps, um, and different elements and, and, you know, really lead the charge there. And so to me, you know, you have a lot in the fact that this plan has been three years in the making as well, three years since council declared that climate emergency, and still you do not have a council uh, endorsed or council approved plan. So there's a, you know, a couple of reasons for that, but to me that really says something about where we are, uh, you know, what the foundation is for London to move forward on these things, and perhaps a little bit about, you know, the political will or the appetite that's out there among uh, constituents um, as well. So so, you know, to me, there's a real question here about is this going to be, you know, a sort of bold and aspirational plan? You hear city leaders talk about, is this bold? Is it too bold? Is it bold enough? Or is it going to be a more achievable plan um, that brings everyone along? That's a lot of the language in the plan as well, right? Bringing everybody along with it. So to me, that's where I'm kind of coming from because I follow these debates and I'm interested to see what city council will, will not just back or, you know, and endorse, but actually lead. And where's that element of leadership coming from for the rest of London? Hey, thanks, Megan. I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, it's just, this is a really important panel, I think, 
because obviously this is one of the important existential issues of our time. And um, I have, I'm have i a political scientist who focuses on local and urban politics. Um, I haven't for quite a while published anything on environmental politics, but I do follow it, and especially here in London, both because, you know, as a, as a human being and a dad, I'm interested in seeing a planet that everybody can inhabit a few generations down the road. Um, but also because in terms of local politics, issues of climate change are becoming more important. And I'm really interested in both the policy and the politics of this. So what I mean by that is I'm interested in what local governments and cities can do, what kind of policy instruments or levers they can kind of pull to make things happen. And I'm also interested in how that relates to the politics of it, what's easy, what's difficult, the kind of stuff that Megan was just talking about, right? Um, we, of course, know that local governments don't have full policy control over um, things like greenhouse gas mitigation. Um, a lot of the levers of policy control are at the provincial and the federal level, but local governments have extremely important levers of policy control that have to do with the way that the physical environment is built and the way it's serviced and the way that infrastructure is built. So we'll talk about that, I think, later. Uh, so the, the plan that we're talking about is called an emergency action plan. And that sounds like super urgent, right? If it's an emergency and it's an action plan, then huge things are going to happen right away. Um, and so, and I say this now with the greatest of respect. I'm sincere about that to all the people who put a lot of work into this plan and there's much valuable in it, but there is to me a disconnect between emergency action plan and a lot of what we see here. And I think that speaks to the political difficulty of making choices about things that actually have to happen to make a big difference. And so I hope that we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, am I at my time yet? Or can I say a couple more things, John? Um, 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. So I'll say this then. Um, if you look at research on policy processes, any policy process and any planning process needs to do a few things. It needs to identify some goals, then it needs to prioritize, and then it needs to allocate resources in order to make things happen. Um, this plan is great at identifying goals, and there's some really ambitious goals. And there's a ton of potential ideas in here on what needs to get done. But there isn't a lot of prioritization. And the next step of allocating resources this plan can't do that all, but it hasn't really even started. And so I want to talk about that more when we get to the discussion, because I think this plan gets us part of the way there. But the key thing that's missing is these are the two or three things that London can do that are going to make the biggest difference. And that's what we're going to focus on. And that's not in here yet. So I hope it will develop before this plan is finalized. So hi, everyone. I'm Martha. As John mentioned, I really became interested in climate change back in my teenage years, then deciding to study geography for my undergrad and for my master's. And my master's work really focuses on the economic and social dimensions of climate change. So I'm really interested in the, uh, the equity solutions that are in the climate plan. So that's kind of where I come from. And speaking a little bit to the plan, I think in Canada today, at the beginning of 2022, there have been over 560 cities that have declared a climate emergency, London being one of them uh, declaring the emergency back in April of 2019. So it's been a little bit slow moving from, you know, from a researcher perspective, <laughs> but I know um, action can take a really long time. So it's really a good step forward with this plan, but I think there needs to be more high level equitable solutions, realistic solutions outside of just lifestyle changes for individuals to take action. In terms of the business plan, I, I was looking at it and wondering, you know, Know, our commitment strategies and goals really enough to drive change from these big players or are we going to need more good stuff all right now what i want you to imagine is that we're all in comfy chairs and we're sitting around uh, john sorry to interrupt but you have uh, dan leaning online as well that's right dan i'm sorry i forgot you because you're not here <laughs> dan, <laughs> over to you sir <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Wonderful. So um, it's unfortunate. I've been living on Zoom for two years during COVID, and this is the first one that uh, didn't connect. But anyway, if you can hear me, it's a start. Um, my background, uh, John mentioned a little bit about it, 
in urban design. I work with builders, developers, municipalities, interest groups, and particularly urban design and its linkages with sustainability and with public health. Um, as mentioned by Martha, to date, over 500 municipalities have declared a climate change emergency. And I do a lot of work on uh, sustainable guidelines for different city areas. And what I'm seeing is you know, when the emergency has been declared, some have started, some have actually been at it for a while. And sadly, some are doing almost nothing. It's like declaring the emergency was actually doing something, which it wasn't. But it's good to see London's very thorough approach. I've been reading background material feels like for a couple of days now on uh, what you're what you're working on. I think local cities like London can control many mechanisms that can be very effective in GHG reductions. Uh, you control official plans, building permits, transit, land use decisions. They're all key. I'm also pleased to see in section six of the report that urban design is acknowledged. Uh, is playing an important role. And I'd also like to point out here that uh, there are reciprocal benefits here that um, good urban design is clearly linked to climate change mitigation and to public health measures. So I've written public health guidelines as well as climate change documents. They share very strong common principles, which I think are very important. There are different inconsistencies in greenhouse gas release in city areas in London. In urban areas, for example, it's going to be more about the buildings, more compact. Um, and in suburban areas where separated land use, low density, car dependency, it's going to be more about how do you mitigate uh, transportation releases. I think also the fundamentals of good urban design are important. And I would go back to John's point on um, what can London do in the bigger scale of things. Um, I would suggest that a number of measures taken to uh, deal with climate change actually result in better urban design. So on a global scale, you're not moving the meter too much, <clears throat> but you're making it a much more livable environment for the folks uh, living in London. And looking at diversity of land uses, housing choices, mobility choices, mm -hmm. and understanding the proximities. I always ask when we're on a design team the following questions, and uh, the same with clients, and the same when I'm working with students. What can you get to in two minutes? You walk out the front door. Can you get to a local park at the bus? Can you get a link to nature? That's all very important to seniors, kids, dog walkers in the morning. What can you get to in five minutes, a 400 meter walk? School, transit, neighborhood park, some services. What can you get to in 10 minutes? Now that's a bit of a stretch, um, 800 meters. Higher order transit, secondary schools, shops, services, work. And I would suggest that in a suburban context, for example, if you have to walk more than 10 minutes on a cold February dark morning, to get to transit, you're going to be saying, when can I afford that second car? When can I afford that third car? And those are not questions you want to ask uh, when it comes to climate change. So the fundamentals of, of uh, urban design fit extremely well with uh, GHG reductions. And just to quickly finish, you know, there's billions of dollars that go into the ground every year with new development and infrastructure. Um, if it creates car dependency, if it separates land uses, if it can't support reasonable transit, if it limits housing choices, then we're really supporting an old, outdated model. It will never deliver on the targets that we as a country need to make, nor what the London plan sets. The other thing about infrastructure, once it's in the ground, no one is going to dig it up. It's millions and millions and millions of dollars. It's going to be there for its life generation, probably 20, 30, 40 years. And that's a huge lost opportunity. You're looking at net zero in 2050. It's hard to achieve. I've tried this with community design. It'll, it's going to require political will, smart policies, and the innovation of the building and technology sectors. I'll leave it there, John. That's great, Dan. Thank you very much. Um, and all that stuff is I get really excited about because it's planning and design stuff. Um, so I'd, I'd like to start now from the comfy chairs, um, speaking with uh, 
Martin, I, I would like to ask you a question because okay. you were really rolling there. And um, <laughs> you, as, as, as a, a professor that deals with local politics and understands what's happening across the country and, and the world, in fact, and uh, uh, how cities operate, I'm just wondering if you can tell us what do you think that the most important levers are to the city of London that are available to the municipality that can have a real impact on greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And the second part of that is, so that's more global, what are the levers? And then how do you think the plan that's been prepared takes advantage of those? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, John. Um, so in terms of what the levers are actually, a lot, um, a lot of what we just heard, actually, right? Uh, that's that local governments have control over what we, what we often call the built environment, um, and that control over the built environment has a huge impact on emissions, right? Uh, so, I think I think you showed this on the screen. The you showed the relative um, proportion of emissions in London from different sources, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So the top two sources by far are personal vehicles, i.e., cars. Number one like 45% of all emissions in London come from driving cars. Um, and then next, home heating, right? Uh, with a close second, natural gas, right? So patterns of car use and patterns of housing are things that local governments have a lot of influence over, right? Because they control planning and development processes, as Dan was saying. Um, so there's a few different policy levers that I think are really important at the local level. And first I'll talk generally, then I'll talk London a little mm -hmm. bit, right? So I think in general terms, first of all, there's of course the, the land use planning process, which Dan was talking about. All right, so land use planning sets where housing is gonna build, be built, how it's gonna be connected through transportation, how far apart the housing is, um, how big the housing is, where other services are. And all of that cumulatively has a huge impact on our emissions. All right. Um, so I, I looked this up the other day when I was thinking about this panel. In 2019, um, the city of Toronto had about 30% lower per capita emissions than the city of London mm -hmm. uh, using the same methodology for figuring out the emissions. And that's not because Torontonians are such great environmentalists compared to Londoners. It's just that Londoners live farther apart. They use cars more. And on average, they live in bigger houses Am as I well. Am I hearing you right? You're saying, so, listen, if you're all spread out, doesn't matter how many solar panels you put on those roofs, you're still going to have... Yeah, well, it matters a little. Out. It matters a little. But, you know, I think the you know, being really spread out in London is actually a really big part of the problem, right? And so urban planning can address those things. And in fact, we have in London the plan that you really helped to spearhead, the London plan, that already encourages the city to grow more compactly. But... It's not mentioned that much. It is referenced in this plan, but uh, this plan doesn't really kind of like lean into the London plan. And I think that's one thing that this plan could really do is really emphasize that the London plan has a lot of foundations for building a more compact city and that we should build on that. For example, by using another policy tool, which could be really important in Ontario, developers are charged money for being able to develop, right? It's called development charges. Many of you know about this. Um, in London, currently, there's standard development charges, for example, for one unit of housing. As part of developing the principles of the London plan, we could be in London differentiating those development charges based on the carbon impact, anticipated carbon impact of a development. Is it in the center of town? Is it way out in the suburbs on acreages, right? The worst thing for emissions is 4,000 square foot houses on acreages, right? Um, so there's all of those kinds of elements. The other, the other set of policy tools that I think is really important has to do with infrastructure and especially transportation infrastructure. All right, so uh, the city's responsible for building, maintaining transportation and transit systems. Um, and of course, if all the housing is spread out, then higher order public transit, subways and BRT doesn't make sense. So you got to get the housing picture right as well. But there's also a lot of policy leverage to be gained from how a city chooses to invest in its transportation system, right? And so one of the key things, and this is mentioned in the plan a little bit, but again, it, get lo it gets lost in a sea of other things in this plan, all of which are important, but which are much smaller, right? So one of the main things that the city of London could do 
is to really shift investments from road infrastructure to transit infrastructure, right? And there's been a conversation about this. And I'm sure Megan will talk about this. There's a political problem in London, right? Around the same time that our city council declared a climate, climate emergency, it voted against half of a bus rapid transit system, which would have, which actually still will bring significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, but would have been much more important, right? I've got a juicy question for Megan on that one. So, so that's yeah. the kind of investment that a city can choose to make. So the city has really powerful policy levers under its control. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, I'll, that's, I'll, that's I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Yeah. Awesome, Martin, thank you. Next to Katrina. Um, so what, what surprised me in our conversation, Katrina, is that you're a climate change scientist and um, you know, you're dealing with the science of it, and yet you talk a lot about societal shift. And so I wonder if you can just expand on that for us a little bit about what, what's the importance from that perspective uh, in your view and how does the action plan that the city's prepared here um, address that, that aspect? Yeah, so uh, I want to pick up on a couple things that uh, Megan and um, Martin said as well in answering this question. Um, you know, Megan, you talked about a delay in action. And uh, as someone who's been watching the climate story unfold for 30 years, I feel there's been a huge delay in action. And this is why I'm pushing <laughs> this idea that we need more, uh, a deeper change, uh, a societal change, a paradigm shift in our thinking, if we're really going to tackle climate change. And um, I totally agree with you, Martin, about the sprawl in London. Um, I think we have to think about that in our societal shift. So where my ideas are coming from are actually, I've had the great privilege of working with a couple of people, Sarah May Chitty, who's on Ishnebeck, and um, also Serena Mendesville, who's from the uh, Six Nations of the Grand River. And they are teaching me, they're teaching me a lot. And I think if we could build on uh, indigenous perspectives, we could um, really make the kinds of change we need. So things I'm thinking about are much greater respect for the land, the water, our atmosphere. And also, um, I think it's really, really important that we only use, we only take what we actually need. And these are, maybe it seems simple what I'm saying, but we don't do it. And uh, you just gave a lot of great examples of that, Martin. When we, I drive out Oxford Road towards um, Gideon Road, uh, it's just incredible how much growth there is out there. And people have accused me of being against development. I'm not against development. I'm not against people having homes, but I don't see respect for the land. I don't see respect for the Thames River. I don't see respect for the atmosphere when I look at that. And when I ask people, you're building houses out here, and now you're saying we also need to expand the road because there's too much traffic. How is that responding to climate change? How is that putting us on the right uh, road forward? So that's what I'm meaning when I talk about a societal shift. And I don't see that in the plan. The plan, I, I want to commend uh, the city for putting the plan together and for, um, it's an incredible amount of work. There's no question about it. But I, I really feel strongly that if we're going to uh, make an impact here, it's going to have to have core values that are underpinning that plan. And I don't see that. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And great. Thank, thank you, Katrina. That's great. And one thing, I, uh, you know, again, it's, it's really interesting. We'll get into this a little bit deeper, but um, beyond the science is the politics and the way that we operate as humans in our society. And those are two really tough things to take on, um, but so instrumental uh, in where we land on any climate change plan. And I just want to point out, you know, we're talking about the city of London's draft plan, which as I think everyone said, is it's pretty amazing what's been pulled together here, but it's also a springboard for other communities across the country. Some of which have prepared plans like this, but others that are still preparing them. So, you know, I think municipalities are wrestling with this and that piece of societal change 
And that relates to what's palatable in terms of politics. So I'm going to go to you then, Megan, on that, and then I'm going to come back to Martha and Dan. And, and so what's palatable politically is what's going to dictate what happens from here. So you and I have sat together in some rooms where we've seen some really good, I think, public uh, initiatives that we're going to affect certain people. So affect, um, in some cases, powerful people, in some cases, everyday people. And uh, so the politics are pushed back. So it's the people, the community push back on, on uh, local politicians. And this is happening again across uh, the country, across uh, the globe, I'm sure, in cities. So my question to you is, do you think that there is at the local level, so maybe generally first and then more specifically to the city of London, are, is there that operational space or political space for politicians to actually make those difficult decisions that are needed to get us from where we are to where we need to get to. In particular, when there's pushback from people saying, what you're talking about is going to make me less comfortable, it's going to be inconvenient, it's going to cost me more, you know, those kinds of things. Can local government actually do it based on what you've seen? Man, it's such a good question, John. And the thing that comes to mind for me, and another reason why I think the timing here is very uh, interesting and potentially problematic, is where are you in the four-year cycle, right? Where are you in the four-year council term? And where we are right now is just a little bit more than six months out from a municipal election. And I thought this this was never more evident, I thought, then on the very initial debate that council had about this plan, which was very muted because the plan was just intended to be tabled and then come back next week, as we as we know, for this public meeting and, you know, more public and uh, and political debate. And I think you saw that tension on city council, right, about what is palatable, not just for, you know, an elected official, but for their constituents who they're going to have to answer to at the ballot box, you know, in a few months. And so I think uh, it was really interesting for me to notice, uh, you know, who's making the strongest statements on council about uh, providing leadership, about charging ahead with this plan. And, you know, it's not to say there are definitely some uh, councillors who have indicated that they're going to be running again, who who are stepping up and saying, this is a plan that we need to, um, we need to invest in and we need to lead. But some of the strongest champions, I think, are folks who have either declared they're not going to run again or who we can kind of deduce may not run again. And to me, that was really interesting, right? Do you have it? Do you need that freedom of, I'm not going to have the check and balance of my ward you know, saying, sorry, too bad. You know, we don't feel the same about the, the bold action that's needed here. We care more about our property taxes or whatever the case may be, right? Uh, and so, you know, you asked, is there that space? Is there room? I mean, I think so. But I think we have to acknowledge to the kind of uh, ambition or what's the word, you know, in a sense, bravery to say, this is so important that I'm going to push it ahead, even if it loses me some votes, right? And there's, of course, the flip side where you're probably going to gain some votes too, right? But to me, this is a really interesting um, shift and not to be too general about it, but I think you see that a little bit in, um, in different generations or different ages, perhaps, right? Maybe different wards to make up across the city. It's really interesting. And so I think that's going to play a huge role. This election factor is how far are politicians willing to push it? And I, I really love the examples that Martin gave, right? I mean, we're talking about things like uh, the London plan, how we grow. We're talking about our housing strategy. John, you mentioned, you know, that pressure and wrestling with the idea of this is going to make me less comfortable. Well, how often do we see, you know, a high rise or not even a high rise, let's say a townhome proposal or, you know, a six story apartment building and the neighborhood saying no way, no how. And the politicians, you can see the struggle, right? They're saying, here's what's allowed. And yeah, you know, here's what we're trying to do to show our constituents that we hear them. So I just think there's, there's, it just show it shines the light right on okay we've got the science 
And then we've got the politics, right? And I, I'm just not sure that this is maybe optimal time for those to match up when we're charging into an election season. I think, you know, if it was two years ago, maybe you have a little bit more time to show your constituents what you mean by leading on this file for good or for bad. Yeah, oh, that's great. And I think that the word that you were trying to find when you were wrestling there to find a word, I think it's leadership. And you know, how strong can leadership be at the local political level in the face of pushback from the community? And so I'm not sure that there's anything at Barton's point, anything more impactful on growing inward and upward in a, in a new way, which is required for climate change, than the two legs of rapid transit, which have been left off the table for now. So that, I think that's just a glaring example of where local politics can undermine big picture um, goals and objectives. So with that, I'm going to just, uh, I know that I could, I could feel Martin's chomping at the bit, but I'd like to get to the others and we'll come back to them. And I promise, I, I think that it's really good stuff. Um, but I want to go to Martha for a moment. And uh, Martha, what you and I talked a little bit about was inequities that climate change brings. And um, climate change doesn't affect everybody equally and the resources that they have available to them money, education, know-how, supports around them can really have a, a major impact. So can you just expand on that a little bit and tell us about your interest with respect to equity and its impact on climate change? And if there's anything in the plan that you wanted to point out, or you don't have to relate it to the plan, but just uh, from that perspective, maybe expand for us. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So in terms of the plan, there's a lot of mention of equity and individual action. And you can tell that's kind of where I have my gripe with it. So, you know, those of us in this room are privi privileged enough to have uh, these shifts in our lifestyle to make these small adjustments, to be able to shop more sustainably, but try telling a shift worker, you know, you're going to have to take the bus now, no way, like no how, like they're going to be losing out on money. So my issue with that is a lot of the, you know, there's a lot of mention of equity without giving higher level solutions instead of just individual action, individual sustainable action. So I think there needs to be more focus put on higher level solutions. And the city has done a good job in the past of um, providing these opportunities through things like the Million Tree Challenge, things like Green in the City and the creation of the Green Bay program. But I think there really needs to be um, a step up from both the city as well as businesses in terms of filling this gap. So things like um, equitable solutions would be things like attending this event, holding events like this, having conversations where people aren't privy to these conversations that council are having, maybe don't have time to attend. So they need to have alternative solutions on, you know, how to get this information. Good stuff. Okay. So you know, that's an interesting perspective, really important and not spoken about in, um, as frequently when it comes to climate change. And it is nice to see that the city's uh, taking a bite out of that and, and understanding it and trying to address it. So I, I'd like to go now to Dan. Dan, you on the line with us still? I'm still here. You did a great job in your opening remarks talking about urban design and how uh, the, the shape of a city, a macro, a neighborhood, maybe one level down, streetscapes and buildings, how all of those things really affect the way that people use their communities and so the impact that it has on, on greenhouse gas emissions. But I'd, I'd like to just uh, turn to um, something that you deal with regularly, and that is the private sector and the development community. And I'm wondering if you can tell us what your thoughts are on how the development community would likely view this plan. We don't want to put words in anybody's mouths. Um, uh, so I'm not suggesting that you're representing uh, the thoughts of our development community here, but you deal with these uh, types of um, communities, development uh, industries across the country. So what are your thoughts? Uh, how do you think they'll be reacting and uh, how would they perceive this plan? Well, it, it it's interesting because um... Uh, the development industry is the industry that really builds our housing. Um, and in a competitive market, they can do that effectively. But the concerns that they have and they have told me about, and right, to a great extent, it's logical, and I agree, and sometimes I butt heads with it. But um, the first thing a, a developer is going to look at facing a new plan, um, in particular, if it's a 
it's coalesced into a, um, a sustainability guideline document that's going to require aspiration as well as mandatory proof of what's being done, how targets are being met. One is going to be timing. When's it going to happen? How long is it going to take? And when I submit a plan, are you going to be able to deal with it or am I going to get messed around um, because people need education, timing, need to refer back and so on? Another one is they're going to look at the um, the extent of mandatory issues. Is the technology available? Who Who is good at building it? I've worked with builders where new tech has been put in, and sadly, two years later, the guy's broke, um, and it's hard to get parts for things. One of the huge components they're going to look at is market response. Most big, sophisticated developers won't budge unless they have a clear indication, usually done through focus groups, of where is the market? Who wants to live here? What do they want? Uh, the good thing is it's no longer there. People are just looking at a, a smart looking kitchen. They're looking at a smart neighborhood. Where's the school? What's functional? What are the bigger components? Where's the park? They're going to look at um, competition. There needs to be the proverbial level playing field. Um, if you're going to impose standards on me and it's going to raise the cost of housing, um, what about the guy in the, uh, you know, across the road or in the next municipality? If he can sell a house for $15,000 less than I can, I'm at a disadvantage and can't compete. So they're going to worry about that. And then they're also going to look for costs. What, what are the costs to bring, uh, these, uh, um, uh, uh more advanced heading to 2030, 2050, all of the implications there. I would add the other side of this story is kind of interesting and to Megan's point, the reluctance for change in the um, urban design guideline documents we just got approved in the town of Whitby um, a couple of years ago, actually just a year and a half ago, huge reluctance. Um, council had decided it was time. They declared an emergency. They needed a plan and they needed guidelines um, that really set out clear aspirational as well as mandatory. And this guideline document will change. And we came in at the ground level. We really identified all the stuff you got to do anyway in your OP zoning and various policy oh, documents. Okay. And then it ramps up every three years. So when it came to the vote, um, we had done extensive consultation, which you have to do with the building industry, with residents, with interest groups, with council. Um, it was still a dodgy thing. Uh, development industry said, you know, this isn't mandatory in the building code. It's not mandatory in the planning act. Um, we don't think we should have to do it. Um, and now, not all developers agree with that, and some will come up to me afterwards and say, look, I know where you're going. This is the future, but I can't, I can't support you on this. The, um, at the end of the day, uh, with some really amazing uh, young uh, Greta Thunberg speakers influenced by who are very effective, um, the local, uh, sorry, the MP, federal government, showed up to the council meeting, which is rare, and said, this is absolutely the right thing to be doing. The development industry said, no, you got to do this. Counselors were kind of wavering. And they said they turned to the lawyer, the town lawyer, who will, you know, reluctantly take a position, particularly if it's not their main area. But the lawyer said, you know what? These are guidelines. Um, and the guidelines are permitted. You're asking me, I'm a lawyer, to talk about sustainable guidelines. I'm not the right guy, but I can tell you from a legal point of view, the municipality can move ahead, should move ahead. Uh, nothing is being asked right now that is untowards. It will be gradually shifted and ramped up uh, year by year. You will have input to it, and I uh, I am in support of it. Well, those councillors felt satisfied, and, and the mayor came out and said, absolutely, we have to be doing this. And no one knew what his position was going to be. Now, some of these are politically astute moves. All of these people were sort of midterm. I'm not sure if they're running again. I think most are. But at the end of the day, it was a 100% vote for the guideline document. And we were thinking, man, we may get 40%, 50% of the vote. And the Clean Air Alliance came out and did a lot of great social media on uh, 
the need for climate change uh, mitigation. So these things can turn around. There, the 60% of Canadians identify climate change is the major global threat that we're facing. And it's how do you harness that into a document and tools that you can apply uh, to the community that will actually start to give you some results. Good stuff. And you know, one of the things I heard you say is when it comes to the development community, uh, if you're adding costs, um, it's gotta be a level playing field and there, there should be on the other side of that added opportunity and hopefully, you know, revenue opportunities. If you're just adding costs and there isn't some sort of market opportunity, then you're probably pushing on a string. No, that, that's yep. great. Thank you. Um, so folks, we've got about half an hour left. We want to leave some time for chats, but I'd like to do some rapid fire. So I'm going to ask you to cooperate with me <laughs> and um, just really quick one minute kind of answers. So um, my first question is, uh, let's go to uh, Martin. Um, biggest challenge you think that this plan will have for being implemented? Um, oh my goodness, one minute. Um, I think a combination of what Megan was talking about and maybe what I had mentioned as well before. Um, timing before the election, I think it's challenging. Um, Local government is nonpartisan, so sometimes it's really like herding cats in terms of getting big things done, right? Because everybody is their own counselor, and uh, everybody's looking out for for you know getting reelected. So, I think that is an issue. Um, but I think the other big challenge that can be overcome is that really this plan identifies like you know 130 different things we can do. If this plan can be revised to identify three or four significant things that can be done. And if there's enough political consensus around those three or four things, it becomes a more manageable beast, right? And it becomes something that a critical mass of councillors might be able to get behind even around election time. So and I think- Can you have a big plan with these uh, things that, but then identify this is the chunk we're taking on for this period? That exactly, yeah. So you have the big plan, but the big plan also identifies kind of, as it were, kind of the low hanging fruit, the, the, the significant things that can be done right away, yeah. right? Okay. Okay. If, if there's political consensus around a couple of those, then that gets the ball rolling, right? right? Okay. Mm. Megan, I've noticed when I tweet anything about climate change, I don't get a lot of retweets, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> and, and including the people on the panel. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, but uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, and, and you know, recently I spoke to another member of the media and they said, this is not a big issue with folks in the London community. It's not, it's not gaining a lot of traction. A, rapid fire, is that true? And B, why do you think? You know, that's so interesting, John. And again, without trying to paint too broad, paint London with too broad of a brush. Um, you know, I think you see in the reaction to the plan or maybe in the reaction to your tweets, you know, people are in many ways, I think there's a segment of London anyways that, you know, wants council to address um, the, the nuts and bolts thing. Somebody just wrote in about the plan, you know, saying to council, hey, this isn't your lane, right? <laughs> like literally stay in the lane, fill the potholes kind of a thing. And so I think there is, you know, a big segment of our population that says, uh, sure, this is all lovely. The plan looks interesting. Uh, and, you know, what's it going to cost me? Or, you know, you even had some uh, counselors, I hate to pick on this one item, but I will, you know, creating a 72-hour emergency kit. That's an example in the plan, right? As a, what a household could do uh, to better prepare. And obviously that's a great idea, but is how far are we moving the needle, right? Even if we all put together a 72-hour emergency kit, like, what, what have we done at the end of the day? And so I think that's, you know, there's, of course, then another segment of, of London that is saying, hey, I want much more from you, City Council. And I have seen that just yesterday, a whole bunch of letters that will be headed to politicians next week were published. And there are a lot of environmental advocates and a lot of Londoners saying, hey, not only do you need to speed this up, like get the show on the road, approve this plan, I also want to see more. And I just wanted to bounce off uh, some of Martin's points because one of the demands, and it was clearly a form letter that went around, so grain of salt, but was, you know, hey, council, why don't you attach term goals, right? Like create priorities for a council term so that you are held accountable. It's not just, you know, 200 actions here and, oh, maybe we'll get them done in the next 
20 years, maybe we won't attach those term limits. So there's an accountability for the politicians, because I do think we're still going to be facing that push pull every four years. Right. Okay. I'm going to ask Dan a question, but I'm just going to put Katrina on notice that I'm going to ask you what one thing would you suggest is like an paramount one or two. I, so I'll give you some time to think about that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, Dan. <laughs> What yeah. uh, do you like about this plan? There's lots to like, um, and it's you know a huge positive step forward. Any thoughts? What do you really like about it? I think you've done a lot of work, and I think it I, I is, haven't, I it's. I haven't done anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The city, the city, yes. I think the people responsible have done a great deal of work. Uh, I've been reading through and reading through. I've even copied out some. Some of the charts and so on because they're really they're, they're going to be helpful to me too and um i think that the um the amount of background the research and what's happening in london its perspective within ontario within canada and then the local measures that need to be taken um are are clearly thought out uh, what i do think that needs to happen next though is it needs a strong implementation tool how does it hit the ground? How do the wheels that you're putting on it right now, how do you start pushing it down the road uh, so it's effective? And I think probably at some point you're going to have to face what kind of a, a, a green sustainability plan with measures built, performance measures built into it that are used for any form of growth uh, to ensure it's actually being achieved and that there are, are real real targets. But the background work is there to support it. And I think that properly handled, there's definitely public support for these kinds of documents. And then I think really, how do you how do you now pivot and turn it into a an implementation tool uh, with, with a clear strategic path and roadmap that's going to say, now this is how it's going to uh, start. Here's the timeline. Here are the measures. And you know what? Every three or four years, we're going to have to ramp them up if we're going to hit our 2030 target and our 2050 target. Okay, that's great. And that kind of goes to Megan's point as well about, hey, maybe there's an opportunity for doing council term, evaluate every year during the council term and make it really transparent as to what kind of progress has been made on, on the plan. Katrina, did I give you enough time? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So um, I think I'm, I'm thinking a lot about this tension that you mentioned, Megan, between science and politics. And uh, also thinking about your opening, John, and that this is an emergency. And that means we don't have a lot of time. We don't have the luxury to sit back and kind of wade through the weeds. We need action and we need it right now. So to me, that's the biggest challenge. And as you were speaking, Megan, I kept thinking, I feel like I'm in a, uh, a don't look up moment. Like we just can't mess around. We need to do, we need to take action. I think transportation is key in London. And I think public transit, rapid transit are really, really important and are discussed in the plan. But I think we need really specific targets. And I, again, I want to come back to this idea of values and uh, I think when I think about being a politician and I think about being a leader and being faced with an emergency, I don't want to elect someone who's thinking, is this palatable for my con constituents? I want to elect someone who's thinking, how do I make sure future generations have a, what, you know, a happy life? That's what you should be thinking about. And I think the other really important thing is I work with young people all the time. And if you talk to young people, they are very um, keen to see change and to tackle climate change. And so I think as a politician, you want to be reaching out to those people right now because it's their, you know, we have six to 17 years uh, and if we stay on the emission pathway we are right now, we will be at one and a half degrees warmer than the average. So that's a very short period of time when you're talking about monumental change that needs to happen. So that to me is the biggest challenge is time.
quick point, and then we're going to go to questions from the group, um, and I'll explain that in just one. Minute. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering, Martha, uh, rapid fire. Um, what did you like about the plan? What is it that uh, you thought hey, from the Yeah, so I really liked kind of the foundation that the plan laid, talking about how, um, like, the emissions. So, for example, 95% of emissions of GHG emissions come from energy use, and that can further be broken down into heating, cooling, and um, vehicle use. In addition to that, there was a survey in that that talked about Londoners and their environmental literacy. So, I think on a scale of like one to 10, the average Londoner answered eight. So I think that speaks to how Londoners are very actively engaged and knowledgeable around climate change. And it's kind of time to move past that awareness and education phase and into the action. Uh, Martin, you look like you want to talk to your mic. One, two, three. Um, okay, Martin something uh, real quick real quick yeah um I, just so that we so that i don't sound too negative about what's been going on here in london i think there's been one thing that's been fantastic that's happened recently which is that the climate emergency declaration led to led council to endorse something what's called use of a climate lens for judging new transportation infrastructure investments um and as a result of direct result of that, council last year canceled plans to widen Wonderland Road, which is a $200 million project going forward. So that's the sort of concrete oh. thing that I think a plan like this can really lean into and people could actually get behind. You know, yeah. so if you, if you, for example, expanded that lens to make it part of the capital budget planning process, right? I, um, I think that's like a, for me anyway, it was a litmus test because that is really clearly running right through the gut of the city uh, to turn that into a six lane highway essentially versus keeping it for and looking at other ways um, to, to serve that population that's trying to move on that corridor. Now, it's not over. No. What they did was they deferred it until the mobility plan that they're now preparing uh, comes forward. But that's one to look at because I think it is a real good litmus test for um, putting your money where your mouth is or rubber hitting the road, so to speak. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Uh, what I'm going to suggest to the folks that are online, if you use the chat feature, is that right, David? Um, David's going to keep a uh, uh, record of some of those questions. So that's how we're going to get questions from the group online. And if there are questions, I have more questions if there aren't any uh, coming from the crowd here, but uh, is there anybody that has questions for the panel that's here today? Okay, yes, go ahead, please. Uh, so my question is, kind of has like two parts to it. So um, have there been other municipalities across Ontario or Canada that have also experienced difficulties in implementing their emergency climate change plans? Um, and if so, what does that say about municipal climate action as a whole? And the second point, if there have been municipalities across Ontario or Canada that have successfully implemented their climate change initiatives, what about their approach uh, allowed them to be successful? And how can London learn from them and adopt it to their own plans? Okay, I'm going to try to capture that. I think that's what you folks want me to do. Is um, It's a two-part question. The first one is, are other municipalities across Canada um, have they experienced problems moving forward with their climate action plans? And if so, what's that say about municipal or city-oriented climate uh, plans and their ability to move forward? Um, the second part of the question was, remind me again, sorry. Um, like municipalities across Ontario or Canada that have been successful? And how right, can right. How can we learn? Right. So the second part was uh, what municipalities have met some success in moving these types of initiatives forward and um, what can we learn from their approach? Thank you for the question. Yeah, so I can start and kind of speak to municipalities that have successfully implemented that. So Hamilton actually has done a really good job at um, kind of overturning and in, in, in integrating climate change policy through I believe two main institutions like the Bay Area Council of Climate Change. So for them, they were able to create a separate sector outside of their city to kind of help uh, mitigate and monitor all of their climate change impacts. And they work directly with the city in order to provide this uh, advice and guidance on how to move forward. Anyone else that wants to? Yeah, I'll just briefly say, I think 
my understanding from other people who've done research on this is that a lot of cities have had a lot of problems implementing their climate change plans. Um, and I mean, I think it speaks to the underlying kind of fundamental tension, right? That, uh, you know, people want change in the abstract, but people still don't want to give up their cars and their single family houses and things like this, right? So we are asking people, these plans ultimately ask people to also agree to make fundamental changes and local governments are very responsive to local populations actually right so if local people really don't actually want it it's probably actually not going to happen but i think uh, martha pointed out one way that sometimes successes are made which is uh, you know creating a, essentially like a special purpose body or an institution that brings together some important actors and has some dedicated resources and has the support of the city, it can kind of separate it a little bit from the day-to-day -day politics. And that can actually help things move forward sometimes as well. You know, something that's missing, uh, can you, am I on? Yeah, uh, something that's missing is a standardized way of measuring action. And I don't, you know, this is something that through my research I've been um, exploring. But wouldn't it be interesting if, not do you have an action plan, but what action are you taking? And not just can you measure greenhouse gases, your community greenhouse gases, but and emissions, but what is it that you're doing? And how does that compare to other cities? And that's what is brought forward when you have a standardized measurement tool. It can start to put pressure on local municipalities to keep up uh, with others and make sure that at least on a per capita basis or given the, the size of the municipality, they're doing their part. And that's where that collective action could potentially come forward. But I, I haven't seen anything yet by way of a, a standardized or even useful tool that can be applied um, across all municipalities. But I think it would be a great tool if we could get there. John, I, I, could I, I have something? Yep. Yeah, thanks. Um, the, um, what, what's interesting on the uh, standardization, um, 10 years ago, our climate action plans are starting to get started at a number of different municipalities were starting to respond to uh, policies, guidelines in the uh, official plan. And um, what's come out of that is that back, back then there was, there's gonna be a made in Pickering uh, sustainability plan. There's gonna be a made in Brampton, made in Guelph. And people began to realize uh, that when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of actually measuring energy, measuring uh, air quality, measure, using the indicators to give you a good idea of greenhouse gas release and, and the effect. Um, that there's some pretty common standards. Lead ND came along, I was involved in that, which had some really tough uh, measurements uh, that are being applied throughout North America and actually globally now. But a number of local municipalities have been borrowing from one another in, in a very um, positive way, the kinds of steps and measures that are needed in order to understand um, if you if you've got an effective program and how do you how do you leverage change how do you leverage change in the marketplace? Um, uh, so municipalities are borrowing from one another and they're learning from the experiences. And as, as Martha mentioned and, and as Martin mentioned, um, they're all difficult. Every plan, even though there's, it's getting easier to put the science together of saying what needs to be done, um, uh, the political process is, is fraught with hazards and can be very difficult, but that's where the consultation process is integral to bringing forward a sustainability plan. Uh, a comprehensive plan being policy and specific uh, uh, technical measures that you need at the end of the day to verify that it's actually happening. So I think there is there is sharing and it's happening more and more. The other thing I would say, for example, in Ontario, we're behind where BC is in the sense that there's a bit of a renaissance right now on sustainable guideline documents to guide growth and change in municipalities in Ontario. BC has actually moved beyond that. BC is now, um, uh, they're going, it's going straight into policy. It's not uh, a guideline. This is what we want you to do. It's a policy. This is what you have to do. Um, and the building industry is working with that, et cetera. So it's interesting. There are different shifts around the country. And of course, 
regional locations, temperature, climate, geography, etc., all has an impact. But um, monitoring, uh, we're 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 uh, learning from one another, both our our foibles and our our our, our attributes uh, right. are being shared. Oh, that's great, Dan. And I do know that BC actually, as a province, requires that municipalities prepare these um, climate action plans. Uh, David, could I get uh, a question from yeah. you? This is from the online group. Yeah. I only talked about uh, sort of local municipal emissions and doesn't address emissions coming from imported products or, mm -hmm. or food. Should that be part of the plan? Okay, so uh, just so that the audience at home can hear. So the question was the plan speaks uh, specifically to um, greenhouse gas emissions that are generated here at home within the municipality, but doesn't speak to emissions that are generated by goods and services that are demanded and consumed here, but uh, greenhouse gases are generated elsewhere or in the transportation route to get here. Um, I did point out, and it was one of my slides that the plan does include a slide that shows that, so it acknowledges it. But any thoughts from anyone on what municipalities can do to get beyond just what's happening in their own municipality? So now we're asking cities to not just deal with their own operation, not just deal with what's happening in the broader community, but now going beyond their municipal boundaries. Any thoughts? Go ahead, Martin. Or, or sorry, Katrina. Yeah. yeah, so uh, John, you did point out that slide that showed the table with the, um, I think it's 8.1 compared to the 4.2 mm -hmm. um, megatons of carbon. Uh, the, it's re I don't know how a municipal government could really um, make a change in those um, carbon emissions, except to really encourage in changes in individual behavior. And that is talked about in the plan. And really what it comes down to is, is reducing consumption and reducing, again, I'm coming back to one of the values I, I mentioned earlier, but just using what you need. And I, I don't know that there's much more a municipality can do than try to point that out to people and encourage people to make those changes. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's funny because people don't think back very often to reduce, reuse, recycle. And how it was, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, I'd take a, a can and throw it in the garbage. Now it feels like sacrilege, but it's all about that societal shift, the, the way that people's um, thinking about things goes. And yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And that's how you there, can there, get some of these consumption indicators. Go ahead, Dan. John, oh, sorry, just a very quick point. Um, it's interesting because, you know, we're, we're talking about to a certain extent about embedded carbon. Um, in products, so you know, um, cheaper steel coming from China produced at coal-fired plants clearly is not helping the planet, but it's cheaper and people will use it. Um, the what's interesting is seeing how government. First of all, that's a federal, uh, more of a federal concern than local. But you're starting to see examples where DeFasco, I believe, has just gotten a significant grant to upgrade their equipment. And the concrete industry is getting grants to reduce. They use huge amounts of energy, that so they can compete with offshore uh, concrete being brought in um, based on uh, high carbon uh, use. So there, it, it, it's a really important thing to think about. Um, but and and but it is actually starting to happen uh, in there. The only last real point I would ask to think about is. What is the cost of doing nothing? And at the end of the day, Katrina's concerned about the slow, uh, the slow take up. Um, the other side of the coin on this is if we do nothing, it becomes glaringly ap apparent we can't afford to do nothing. So we've got to, not only is it the right thing to do, <laughs> but we've, we've got to uh, take action. Uh, Windsor just did a study on flooding because uh, they got water on two sides and they realize that they do nothing. The cost is going to be several billion dollars in a few years that could be ameliorated by starting to deal with it much sooner. So um, I think we always need to ask that question too. Yeah, oh, that's great, Dan. Thank you. Uh, Martin. Yeah, and of course, uh, 
we're already dealing with the cost of doing nothing because we were putting more and more into mitigation and we have to, and we didn't talk about that, but that's also part of the plan, right? Um, but I just wanted to reinforce what Katrina was saying that I think, well, first of all, I don't actually, the, the quick answer to the question is no, I don't think the plan should be directly trying to address questions of emissions that are produced elsewhere um, because it's already, I think, trying to take on too much in some ways. But even if we narrow the objectives of the plan to a certain number of key changes, those have knock-on effects. For example, if we build more transit, people drive less, there's less money, uh, there's less emissions being produced by producing cars that people are buying because people are buying less cars, right? So mm -hmm. as, as Katrina said, changing patterns here by changing the form of the city, changing patterns of consumptions has knock-on effects that ripple out through the whole global right. economy. Okay, so I wanted to um, just use that as a springboard. I don't think that this plan goes very far in terms of um, carbon-based accounting. And so the municipality, every municipality has a budget and that budget will say, here's all the things we're gonna do and here's how much it's gonna cost. Well, imagine another column, which is a greenhouse gas column. Um, that's something that could significantly impact the decisions that municipalities make. It could change the debate around what decisions municipalities make. So yes, that capital project is a good example of that, but there are what thousands of decisions that municipalities are making as to what they're going to do each year. So to introduce that greenhouse gas uh, carbon-based accounting, I think could be really significant. And unless I missed it, I didn't really see it in here. And I know there's a complexity with that, but I think that's a, a spot that... Um, For example, linking development charges to carbon-based accounting. That would be interesting, right? Yeah, and the calculation of the development charge and understanding what is the cost of each of these uh, different ways of growing the city and the infrastructure extension. Yeah, including the carbon um, cost of each one of them. I think that that could be another way of shining a light on the implications from a carbon perspective on these different uh, options that municipalities have and change behaviors. Okay, I think we've got time. Oh, what's the last question? Yeah, five more. I'll, I'll combine the next two. Given its complexity, and then related to that might be how do we make sure the plan is implemented? You know, you know the general public, but it's you know it's been proposed, but then also may not enforce it. Yeah, such a good question. And, you know, I think there's still uh, further implementation plans that will be coming with, you know, dollar values um, associated. And I think, you know, that's a big way um, that likely I and others can communicate to the public. But I almost wanted to jump off what you were saying too, John, a, a different form. But what I kind of hear there is you got to give people the why, right? I mean, if you're not on board at this stage with the ultimate goals here, um, I don't think any science or data or number is going to change it for you, right? And we've got to give council the why. Maybe that's, you know, tying your priorities to the term or creating another kind of system, right, where you can see the advantages and the costs. And I think you've got to give individuals the why too. And it's like Martha mentioned, right? I mean, if you are, uh, you know, you're unemployed or you're searching for a job or you're living paycheck to paycheck, is there a lot of capacity, you know, mental or financial to be looking at 200 plus actions in this plan? No. And I think, you know, we we touched on a little bit, but we danced around this idea of transit in the city, transportation in the city, right? I mean, this is a community that has major transit troubles. You can't even get a bus to your job in some cases, right? Key employment areas like industrial parks. And yet this plan is talking about reducing car trips by a third to a half in like by 2030. I mean, what, yeah. like the disconnect there, right? And I'm glad we brought up the Wonderland Road. I think it's the same opportunity um, opportunity and demand there, right? You had some councillors who were against canceling or deferring that project. And I think what they're really saying is what are the alternatives, right? We got to give people a why. If, if you don't have time to deal with this, let's talk about why something else is going to benefit you, how you're going to be able to use transit to get around the city more effectively, or how we're going to provide opportunities for you to get on board, um, you know, if the reasons or the background right now isn't doing it for you. Good stuff. I think that we need to wrap up. I think we could talk about this for another hour or two. But unfortunately, it's 5.30. Unless somebody tells me otherwise, I think we should wrap up. I'll, I'll come to you, Jay. And I was going to do exactly that. Um, 
Uh, well, let's let's start there. Um, I think that I, I want to point out again that this plan is out, uh, has been out for conversation. There's been lots of uh, opportunity already, but it is a public meeting that's coming up. Dave, did you want to speak to that and tell us the time, or did you have something else you wanted to say? Two things, John, and thanks for comments here. On public meeting is on Tuesday, next Tuesday. Tuesday. At Tuesday at four o'clock. First item on the agenda, which is wonderful. Most important, though, here is I, I have six questions. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what committee is it at, just if people are looking online? It's called SP. Strategic Priorities and Policy Committee. Okay, Strategic Priorities and Policy Committee, 4 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday next week. And people can get on, watch it online, and also participate. And I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but if they want to speak at it, they need to, in advance, send it. All those details are on the website, how you do that. Okay. Okay, if you want to speak, you need to register and go to the website. Uh, is that the, the Climate Emergency Action Plan website? No, no. You, no. You go to the council meetings website. Council meetings website. Look for SPPC or Strategic Priorities Policy Committee, and then you'll see how to register. Register, and you'll be able to speak at this meeting. Do it in advance, though. Don't wait till the day of. Okay, thanks, Jay. Go ahead. John, what I want to say from the sit here, thank you so much for setting this up. Dialogue, comment, debate is vital for all of us moving forward. A big part of the team working on a document like this, hearing comments, positive, negative in between. That's what we do. That's how we build better products. All I say though is one thing. When we all live here today, what are the actions you're going to take? Because personal actions matter. 50% of our greenhouse gas is from the people in this room. So just don't always look at big business and urban development or the developers per se. Always say to yourself, I want to live better. You have a big say. All those other pieces are important, but it's about individuals and we can move a mountain without a doubt. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for your leadership. And I know uh, Mike and Pat and um, Jamie, Allison, and I'm probably forgetting others, but uh, great, great team. John and Kelly. You'll see the connections we need to make with academia, with volunteer groups, with the L London Development Institute, with the London Home Builders Association, they are all getting on board one way or another on this plan. We'll get through either soon or very soon. <laughs> That's great. And I, I think that what you've heard from the panel as well today is that timing is of the essence. It's good to debate these things, but it would be a tragedy if things dragged out even further because things don't end up getting adopted for a protracted period. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right, Jay. Um, conversation on climate change in the local setting, in any setting, uh, I think is really critical. And the more conversation, the better. I want to thank the Center for Urban Policy and Local Governance, um, the Department of Geography and Environment for hosting this session for that very reason. I see um, that we've got uh, Zach Taylor here as well, from, who's also Associate Director at the Center for Urban Policy and Local Governance, I believe. And so thanks very much uh, to you, Martin, um, and all the rest at the Center for putting this on. Uh, also, uh, many thanks to, and let's see, I have to make sure I get it right, the Center for Climate Change, Sustainable Livelihoods and Health here at Western, as well as the Council for Canadian Urbanism, who supported the event and uh, made it happen today. Um, I want to thank the panel. Panel, you were awesome. I wish we had another half hour at least to chat, um, but you've been great. Good hear from the crowd. Um, so thank you for your time. I know that you're all very busy and that means a lot for you to be here to talk about this important issue. Uh, is there anything I'm forgetting? Because if not, I'm going to wrap it up then. Again, thanks everyone that is out there in the audience, both in person and online. And uh, please stay engaged and uh, do what you can to address this uh, major issue that's gonna affect us all. Thank you. <laughs>